My name is Sam Hart, and what makes me me, other than my hobbitiness and um, not taking life very seriously, but then way too seriously, I'm just your average happy-go-lucky kind of guy. So as a glimmer in my dad's eye, he was probably uh, two marriages in and in his late 30s by the time he met my mom. He was an atheist. He had grown up in a very rural area in Colorado, but he was a Catholic kind of as a kid and then um, just rebelled against all of that and went in the, into the Navy and became John Travolta in Saturday Night Fever, basically. Driving around to Bentley, started a business. He was very entrepreneurial, got his PhD in human behavior and um, met my mom at a party. And um, they went in the next morning to um, just kind of, you know, clean up and turn on the TV. And there was Jimmy Swagger pointing his finger at them saying, you need Jesus. And they were like, what? We need Jesus. So my dad knew of this church down the street, which is the church I ended up growing up at, San Diego First Assembly of God. And they went to church that morning for some reason he knew about it because his sister had invited him to a play there and uh that's the only church he knew of went there heard the gospel went forward received jesus he tells the story that their life changed overnight like both him and my mom just like all the cocaine and alcoholism stopped even the way they talked and thought everything just shifted it was one of those radical stories and so they were 100 percent all in and um they maybe like a few weeks later, a month later, the pastor was like in a counseling session, like, so you guys might want to consider like breaking up or getting married because your lifestyle isn't really honoring God. And they're like, well, let's just get married, I guess. So they got married like right then, like, <laughs> like that, like a few weeks later. <laughs> and um, so I was the first of five kids and grew up in church, grew up in that assembly of God kind of charismatic style. But it was, um, it was one of those charismatic churches that was very about the word of god so i got a great kind of upbringing with this i think of it as like the fear of god this sense of his holiness and yet this like training to listen a two-way communication you know that i think was so just part of god's sovereignty in my life in fact before there was much of a worship industry i remember one of the most impactful moments being seven eight nine ten year old kid just like in church during worship just like this sense of awe and this sense of god's presence and the only time i've ever seen my dad cry was in worship i remember looking up at him and he was the most kind of like reserved person still is but was so expressive during worship and i just remember thinking like okay so maybe this is where you can be real you know and I think that was really important to be modeled that at seven years old, a guy, an old Jesus movement artist came through our church and we went to this free concert. That was the night I knew what I was going to do with my life. And it wasn't the music. It wasn't the, the songwriting. It wasn't the sound because honestly, it was kind of cheesy. But like it was the way that that artist shepherded the room through songs. And that just kind of like blew my mind at that age, I remember. So it was not long after that I started learning drums started messing with piano. Um, I even started multi-tracking. So now as a music producer, I look back and I see that I was like, I go to thrift stores and buy these tape decks and stack them on top of each other and kind of like create these homemade multi-track sessions. And it just kind of shaped a lot of what I would end up doing. Quickly turned into a songwriter, like by a junior high, I had written 200 songs, something like that. And um, a family friend was like, you need to get this kid in the studio. So I made a 10 song album at age 13, which is really funny. <laughs> Sovereignly, we ended up, my dad sold his business and we moved up to like be on staff basically at this like ministry on this 30 acre kind of compound thing. And um, he was like an author and a speaker. And uh, he started taking me with him to all the churches he would travel to, to like do music like special music. And so that was like training ground for me well before I got interested in, you know, leading worship or doing music professionally, I guess. My parents had this interesting thing where every few years they would get antsy and just want to move churches. So 
by the time I was a teenager, I was exposed to so many different denominational expressions. Mm. Now I look back and I see that as like just learning how to love the church, learning how to love the body of Christ in all of its different quirky ways. Um, and it's funny because I think that in, in a way, I mean, not to embrace anything that's not true, but in a way, the way that we express ourselves as the church around the world, it almost it's like we complete each other, I think. Like some of us emphasize this, other denominations emphasize that. And taken all together, you see this like mosaic of Christian beliefs that is kind of beautiful. And I, I say quotes because there's a book by a guy named Olson called The Mosaic of Christian Beliefs that really helped me be able to put language in and appreciate what I kind of grew up experiencing. Uh, one of the churches we were at is where at probably age 13, 14 is when I started getting really involved with just serving, like playing guitar, playing whatever as part of the team. That was the community that we moved to. That was the community where my wife grew up. And that's where I met her was at this church that we started going to that was kind of like a non-denominational type church. Joined the band and the youth group. At the time, it was just like good old rock and roll. And, um, and then we'd get to play in big church or whatever. And yeah, it was very formative. I look back at this time and we haven't really gotten to when I was part of the music business. I was part of this hip hop group, went on tour and all that stuff right out of high school. And after a couple of years of that came back home and needed something to do, got some odd jobs, and that's when I started leading worship. Now, I had an issue, I had an attitude problem with worship, because this was in the, right at that turn of the millennium, where all of a sudden worship became a hot commodity in the industry. Like, we saw Hillsong and Passion and maybe some Chris Tomlin or whatever popping off. Overnight, it felt like you had Audio Adrenaline and Cutlass making worship records. In my mind, I was like, that's interesting, that's kind of weird. And so, um, I entered into leading worship as like a part-time job because I needed a job. And it was like that time when you could get paid decent money just because you could play guitar and sing. And it's so funny looking back that I was given a platform as a punk kid and that was already like starting off a bad recipe. But in God's sovereignty, he used that to bind me to his heart is how I see it. He kept me close because there's built-in accountability. Even in the most unhealthy places, you have to still get up on that platform and face your own self, you know, every single time and ask like, where's my heart at, you know? It took me years, so I was full time at, um, on staff somewhere for 16 years before I left leading worship um, full time, like in a staff position way. Over that time, and I would say especially since I left, I've learned some self-awareness. I can look back now at those early years and see that a couple of things. One, there was a point in my life where I think some of the things I needed, just feeling worthy of love or finding acceptance or being believed in, some of these things, for some reason I didn't have those or feel those. So I began to look for that in other ways. And I think worship leading became a place where I felt one, I could get a sense of like meaning or importance, or I could get a sense of love. And I think a lot of us do that. Like if, and so I talk about self-awareness. Self-awareness is so important because if we're honest with ourselves and we can really ask ourselves like, why? Why do I want the platform? Like, what does it give me? What is it, what need does it meet that I feel like I'm lacking? And on a bad day, and I, I could say this in my own story, we can start to do that from a place less of shepherding, discipling, meeting needs, being used by the Lord to help, no pun intended, but be a conduit of the Spirit and a conduit of His healing through us. We can use a crowd or a congregation or an audience or whatever to meet some sort of need we have, some lack. I would say I remember being two, three, four, five, six, and being in a church environment and having this sense that if you have the platform, it means you're important, you're loved, you matter. I wouldn't have known to say it that way at the time, but I remember feeling like, man, I hope 
whatever it was that day. I mean, as funny as it is, even the preacher, like, I hope he's like, he doesn't show up or I hope something happens and I can just get thrown in coach. Or like, I like, I remember as a kid thinking, I hope the drummer like gets sick and can't make it. And I, like, just let me at it. You know, I always had this like sense of just wanting to be in the action. Some of that's probably personality and gifting and things like that. Um, I just wanted to be where the action was and where the fun and the people. But I also had this sense of there's meaning in that and I'm not meaningful unless there's like some visible uh, way to be acknowledged and to add value. Much later in biblical counseling, I had a counselor tell me like, yeah, you've got this thing where you feel like you need to be important. And I remember him saying, bro, rather than trying to be important, get involved with the one who is important. And that was at a time in my life in my 20s when I was needing to be discipled, like realize what grace is and some of those things that I never knew. It was funny, I was in full-time ministry before I really understood what grace was, you know, in my own life and really understood what the gospel was, you know. Every church that I was at, every leader that I served, every staff environment, and I could point out story after story of just things that made me, I mean, we all have these things that, that invite us to be jaded if we let them. But it's funny, I wrote in my journal this morning, I was thinking about these things and, and I wrote this, for every toxic leader, hurtful experience or unhealthy team dynamic, I can point to a way that I was contributing to the unhealth. And so a question that I've learned to ask is like, how is my need for approval my thirst for importance or power, my unwillingness to have a hard conversation with someone or to gloss over things, how is that contributing to this situation or environment? And I slowly started to develop that sense of like, okay, there's, that is not good. This is not unhealthy, but I have a responsibility because I have a voice, you know, on this. And I've used that voice wrongly. So even just that question, um, that you sent me about a funny story or an embarrassing situation. It's funny, like I remember one time I was on this leadership staff on this lead team and we had decided really dive in deep and, and, and figure out like a mission statement and some core values, some things that the church just hadn't had, but it had existed for like 30 something years. And I'm usually that person that's thinking that way like in most team environments, I'm thinking almost like from a brand identity place because I have this communications and marketing sort of bent. And um, how do we, but it's really, how do we take these people with us, you know? And problems show up if I'm part of a team or the senior pastor or the executive pastor, the senior leaders aren't thinking that already. I'm usually the annoying guy in, on that team. And, and in my 20s, I was not, very wise at times and how I would bring those things up. So this whole search for this thing was like an impetus that I had kind of like catalyzed. And uh, we got through this eight months. So we started taking these monthly retreats to really dive in deep to who we were and really start to put language to it. We got to the end of this eight month period. And I remember this one staff meeting where the pastor, the lead pastor, who had been there for 30 years or something, he just like said, you know what guys, I actually love what, the way that we did things before. All this work we've done, let's just like ditch it. I don't remember much after that, but I remember I got so angry and so baffled at that process. Like you've been thinking this the whole time, you know, but basically here I am this punk early twenties kid or late mid twenties, I can't remember. And it was just, and I just like basically told him off just like what a waste of our time like i why can't you be the kind of leader that blah 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 whatever just stupid and it completely embarrassed myself but i remember i got so passionate that i i basically broke down like in that meeting just like tears and passion and you know just like pounding the table who knows what you know there's a side of that that of course it's so inappropriate and embarrassing but then there was also a side of that that caused me to put another layer of a mask on of like I can't have it's, it's not safe for me to like have feelings or opinions or, or express so there was a period after that where I just kind of like put on the like I'm just going to be that guy on the team that just the yes man 
just to smile and go along with things, no matter what I thought. For every issue we can see, we have a responsibility in that, you know? I had a responsibility to be respectful and appropriate, but I also have a responsibility to fully be present in my voice and in the places God puts us in, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Radical honesty is important, but I think how we do it is important. How do you feel going through that situation now if you were ever the the pastor in that situation, how would you respond? In, in a lot of ways, I think that pastor did the right thing because he listened, he let me have my moment, but he still, you know, he pulled me aside later and he's like, you can't ever talk to me like that again if you want to stay on this team. In fact, he basically said in not so many words, like the clock's ticking now. <laughs> but I was ahead of him on that and the clock was already ticking for me, so. It didn't take long when I tr until I transitioned to something else. But I mean, I probably would have said something in the moment, though, in front of the team. Mm -hmm. So if someone says something like that and puts you on the spot, I also think now you have the opportunity to, you need to create closure or else everyone's going to leave that room talking and it's going to turn into this un more unhealthy environment, you know. You're only responsible for your behavior. You're not responsible for what other people do. That's what you should expect from them too. So nobody gets a, a free pass in that. I think, I think part of accountability is us keeping each other accountable to that. You did this and I don't need to carry that. I don't need to take responsibility for the thing you did. But I also need to take responsibility fully for what I do. And how I respond is part of an, is an action, you know? I think a lot of us have sensitivity and have an empathy and kind of like live from the heart and can um, sometimes listen to emotion more than truth. Those of us that are artists um, can, t can sometimes be people pleasers and just do things based on like wanting everyone to love us or like us, to keep the peace. And it could be fake peace, but it feels like peace. So we go with it, you know, and you see that a lot in teams, especially when there's power dynamics, like almost always are in ministries, especially the bigger the church gets. Someone, the buck stops with someone, even with, within an environment with lots of volunteers, there can be these weird power dynamics. And so I think part of healthy accountability in a healthy team is committing to radical honesty together. And I think that starts with us as individuals, like being radically honest to just be like, oh, I'm doing this because it makes me feel significant or important. Like if we just start with that, and some of us don't have that issue, but some of us were meeting some need we didn't get met in our life. Being applauded or being told good job all the time can muddy up our, our motivation. So I think it's even just being willing to like embrace what is my motive for being here in the first place? Is it from a shepherding heart? Is it from a place of serving? Um, or is it something else? And we all have that. So it's not like a pass or fail thing. It's more of just like being able to acknowledge it so that we can navigate through it, honestly. And then I think in the, in the communication dynamic between team members, between leaders and volunteers or leaders and staff or however that works, it's the ability to say like, hey, when you said that to me, that really hurt, you know? And for that person then to be like, you're right, I probably shouldn't have said it that way. And to be able to apologize and just to, to keep short accounts, you know, ministry is just so famous for being, <laughs> for like having all of these weird dynamics happening under the surface that no one's talked about, but everyone's talking about it behind everyone's back. Um, I've experienced that, I've contributed to it. And I just think anytime you have that, the clock's ticking on, on the effectiveness of the ministry or who's gonna be sticking around for how long, you know? Just a lot of unnecessarily, uh, unnecessary pain that happens in ministry because of a lack of radical honesty. If you're listening to this and you're hearing that voice saying like, yeah, that's a weakness you have, so you probably should just like clean toilets or something. It actually doesn't unqualify you. I think it qualifies you for ministry, honestly. Being able to be self-aware enough, and that was gonna be like, you know, you're gonna ask me later on, like what what is a takeaway? Like what's the most important? 
attribute or something, you know, of leadership. And I, and I was going to say self-awareness and radical honesty. They're so connected. And self-awareness is important. All of this is about growth anyways. It's not about putting on a good show as worship leaders. One environment in particular, I used to get quarterly reviews. I always used to wonder and I would ask like, what's successful? Like, obviously I saw my job description when I signed up for this job, but what's a win for us? Like, what's a win for this church? What's a win for my leadership? What's a win, you know, what are we shooting for here? Personally, I just think it's, it's like an ongoing hearing from God and being heard by Him together. That's really what worshiping is. That's what leading worship is. And, and how can we help other people be heard by God if we're not able to assess our own soul and then share that honesty with God? And if we can't do it, how can we lead them to do it? And then to hear from God too, to have God say like, hey, notice that you do that and over the years you've done that. For us to be able to like respond to that, and just be like, yeah, you're right, Lord, help me, help me with that. You know, to seek his word and like figure out how to apply principles and truths to um, our walk and to our leadership, you know. It's not the 20 minutes on stage, I think, that makes us an effective leader. It's, it's like that Monday through Saturday work that we're doing as self-aware disciples of Jesus. And as he's like growing us and as he's improving us and shaping and shaving away and changing us, I think that is what makes us a qualified leader. So that's why I say like being able to identify those things, it's not for shame. It's not to disqualify ourselves from things. But I look back and I think, I was very effective in the flashy ways. I got hired and offered salaries that I never thought I would make because I had the outward stuff. And I look back and I wish that at age 23, 27, 35, whatever, that I could have been self-aware enough to see like, you know, these things are actually making me really good at being like the thing that turns a lot of people away from ministry because I was just good at, at showing up to do the function of a worship leader rather than being a worshiper at home. The way that I was loving my wife and the way that I was parenting my kids and the way that I was um, hanging out with Jesus, like the way that I was investing in the volunteers, like that's one thing I would do differently looking back is like, I would just make it about people first, not excellence, not gifting, all that stuff comes and goes. Like what you're good at is gonna be out of style in five years. <laughs> so you're gonna have to relearn how to be good at something. It's, that stuff move, like moves and shapes and changes all the time. But investing in people and building trust with people and earning a place into their life, to speak into them, that's the stuff that never goes out of style, you know? This book is so powerful if you give it a chance, and I really think that this could even just give language to our team potentially, just to kind of like give a little background and context to this. So there's there's something in psychology called attachment theory. Many of you listening or watching would hear would have heard of that. And what's interesting is this book helps us to understand attachment theory from through a biblical lens. The subtitle is like why you believe, act and feel the way you do about God. So it teaches you a lot about yourself and like of course what applies interrelationally, but it also helps us to understand some of those issues that we have with God sometimes. There's four attachment styles every single one of us has, whether we know it or not, and it's based on how we answer the two questions, am I worthy of love and are others capable of loving me? And how we answer those two questions is formed by the age three or four or five, somewhere in there. And, um, and so a lot of how we end up walking through the world is based on how we answer those two. And so Based on the combinations, we can end up with four personality styles or attachment personality styles. Um, I think one is, is called the secure, which is you answered yes to both those questions. One is the, um, the anxious personality style, which is um, others are capable of loving me, but I'm not worthy of love. That's like the belief behind that one. And then the avoidant is another and the fearful personality style is another. Um, but those attachment styles don't just um, kind of dictate how we interact with our teams and our leaders and people in our lives, like even close family members. It also affects how we like connect with God. So if I believe God's capable of loving me, but I'm not worthy of love, then I'm going to be working 
hard to like earn earn his love or be worthy in some way so anxious attachment style is the one that i kind of identify with and um and so i look back and i see that pattern so much you know in my life of just like trying to be good enough for god and trying to do a good job at things because i can tend to be more more like task oriented um and so it's like oh god i'll do good at this god will build an amazing team and we'll do this god will like have this much of an impact and it's still something that i identify a lot and my typical go-to or like drive in life of just like oh man i want to do stuff that matters stuff that is meaningful and so i have to be careful of that to be able to like delineate oh this part of that is true like i don't want to live a life that's wasted on these things that aren't that don't matter i want to see people as the impact like I want to see souls and lives transformed by truth, by the gospel. So that's why even now in the music industry, I've purposefully made it my kind of like life work to like work in Christians making music, not necessarily the Christian music industry, but believers who feel called to like make an impact through music. And that's why I don't work in pop or country or anything else very often because, I, you know, but at the same time I can take that so far that it's like as we've seen people do where it's just really intense and it's it could be unhealthy where it's like oh man it's on me like this messiah complex it's on me to like go out there and impact people and save souls and um instead of seeing it as like no that's way above my pay grade that's god's job and i get to join him and just be a small part of what he does and that's what i love about our church and the way we do stuff is just seeing ourselves as one of a lot of people that are impacting the world one soul at a time. So that's an example of that. And I, I just really think a lot of people are gonna find some helpful stuff in this book. My encouragement would be God doesn't need you, he wants you. We don't need you, we want you. If you're serving, it's be, and God has you there for a reason. And um, my encouragement would be to myself as a reminder and to all of us, Let's be aware of the ways that we try to use ministry for, to fulfill something in us and, and not let that shame us, but then take that to the Lord and say, God, can you, can you turn that into something helpful? Can you turn that into a way that then I can serve through that, like in it? Um, it's funny, I think of Paul, and, and we don't know all the time the thorn in his side, but we do know that he saw those things as making him himself a better leader and a better servant and in a way for God's grace to abound so God could be strong in our own weakness. And so I think if we could just be self-aware enough to identify those weaknesses that we have or those instincts or those drives or whatever, then we could actually like allow God to use those to, to we can serve from those instead of in spite of or something. And if we could do that as a team, like we already do so well with like emphasizing heart health and all that stuff one will be in the game longer there will be longevity we'll be stronger and more trustworthy as leaders over time and to me that's something that we really need in ministry these days and i'd love to see us be the kind of leaders that stick around and invest in a community and dig roots and make an impact anyways just be encouraged in that if you're listening and um yeah let me pray let me pray for us so father thank you so much that we get to be involved in what you're doing in our communities and in the world and um and just as importantly in, in our own lives i thank you in my own story how you've used ministry to bind me to your heart to keep me close to you um because i just i know myself and uh, i could have squirrel syndrome and just always be you know distracted by the next flashy thing and um and that could have easily led me away from you. And so thank you for keeping me close by giving me responsibility at a young age. Um, and also for teaching me to love your church and to learn how to disciple people, which means sticking around. And um, also thank you for helping me to understand worship way beyond a genre of music, but that it's a posture of the heart and, um, and so everybody that's going through this and everyone involved with our church's worship ministry or any church that they're involved, when, involved in, whoever's seeing this, God, I pray for the gift of a soft heart toward you, the gift of a soft heart towards 
ourselves, the ability to be radically honest first with ourselves and then with the context we're in. God, that we'd be solution-minded, not problem-oriented. It's so easy to look at leadership and point out all the toxic or unhealthy or um, unwanted things instead of being the solution and instead of contributing to health. And so I pray that we would be people that contribute to that environment of health that we want to see. Help us to be healthy as individuals first and, um, and then that we can make an impact beyond that. In Jesus' name, amen.